Hello everyone, welcome to Training Cafe. It's the end of August, 2022. It's hot and humid here in Pennsylvania, kind of the end of the summer season, and we all can't wait for the fall season to arrive. Uh, at least if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, that is what's on the way with better climbing weather in many locations. Uh, I almost didn't do the Training Cafe today, but it's been a few weeks. Uh, and yes, I've been kind of burning the candle at both ends here since I got back from my road trip, but I know, you know, many climbers go in this late August road trip or extend it through the Labor Day weekend here in the United States. And uh, perhaps this is not a day that we're going to get a lot of viewership. Uh, but, you know, these training cafes are on demand uh, after the fact. And, you know, I imagine uh, people will continue to, to come in uh, on down the road to uh, listen in on today's topic, which is little things that can make a big difference. Uh, when it comes to send day. And if you have uh, something that's worked for you, little tweaks, little thoughts, techniques, uh, tactics that have helped you on send day, type them in, share them, because I'm actually going to next week be recording a podcast on this topic. It'll be kind of a full hour where um, I'll you know provide a variety of tips and techniques that uh, you can employ heading into send timber and rocktober, you know, the good climbing conditions here uh, in the Northern Hemisphere that uh, many of us will be enjoying uh, the next, you know, two, three months. Uh, so um, I guess before we get started, it's that time we share coffee together. Climbers around the world unite. Let's sip coffee together. Mm, some send blend here. Gotta love the fizzy vantage semblant. Um, uh, uh, I guess um, we can kind of just jump right into things here uh, in terms of the topic of the day. And we'll keep this episode short and sweet because I got a lot of catching up still to do with my work activities. Uh, and so, um, you know, we all, you know, if you're watching the training cafe, you're someone who probably puts a lot of time into training for climbing, you know, in a climbing gym, maybe exercising at home, hangboard training, you know, all the tools in the toolbox that climbers have available. Uh, and you have to, on any given day or season, you know, pick the right tools to train to elevate your game, to bring up your, your weak uh, traits or skills uh, and hopefully help you uh, take your climbing to the next level and send whatever project or climbing goals you have in mind. And, you know, with all that hard work behind you, you arrive at the boulder, you arrive at the crag, you're at the base of your sport climb or tra trad route. What is the real difference maker? Because, you know, you can't cram training. You can't, there's nothing you can really do the last day or two before your climb, uh, you know, physically, that's going to make a difference. In fact, you know, I often argue that last day or two, if you're, you know, preparing for a sengo, you should really be resting and recovering and um, trying to be physically 100% recovered when you arrive uh, to, uh, you know, do your climb. And, uh, you know, so on that send day, uh, you know, Sometimes things go your way and everything lines up and you, you tie in and you send the route. Uh, but, you know, more often than not, it can be a struggle. Maybe you have to come back a few days or a few trips uh, or at least give it a couple of goes, you know, for the boulder or the route to be sent. Um, and so that's where making good game day decisions can be a real difference maker. And kind of that's the topic of, of this episode. And so I'm going to give you five things that, you know, I've been thinking about this this summer when I was on my road trip. You know, what are the things I do to try to improve my odds uh, when I step up to the route, you know, to, uh, to hopefully red point my sport route. And so uh, here are five things that, you know, I'm going to throw at you. Uh, the podcast that I record a week or so from now, I think will be more like maybe 10 or 15 uh, it'll be an extended list, and actually, if you, you know, any of you have something you want to add to the list, perhaps I can um, borrow it from you and share it with the community as well. So uh, first up, uh, you know, you arrive at the base of the route, 
you need to make every go count. Because, you know, if it's a long, steep route, you know, something uh, that takes 10 or 15 minutes to climb, uh, and it's extremely physical and pumpy, you might only have two or three goes, you know, to really, you know, energy-wise uh, throw out the route. Uh, and for me as an older climber, honestly, I often feel on those really steep physical routes, I have like two really quality attempts. Now, if it's a short sport route, it's only 10 meters long, the crux is at the second bolt, you know, three meters up, five meters up, different story. Uh, because that's almost like a bolted boulder problem. Uh, so that type of route, or if your project is a boulder problem, you might have five or 10 goes in you because although the goes require effort, it, it's not this huge investment of energy. Uh, it's not so pumpy that you get really acidic in your muscles and you know your glycogen stores become de depleted and um, uh, you know, your nervous system gets hammered. And you know again, those long, steep physical routes you know, one, two, three goes, you know, that's about it. You know, when Adam Audra famously was working silence, you know, it would be one send go in a day, pretty much. You'd have to go through this extravagant, you know, warm up to get just in the perfect state. And then it would give it one really good go because he'd be up on that route a long time. Uh, so that's kind of the extreme scenario. And, you know, for me, it's more two to maybe three goes in a day. And for you, if you're younger and more fit, or if you're out of shorter, you know, you might get, get more than that, but make every go count. Uh, and so, um, you know, kind of towards that end, uh, uh, you know, you want to make sure you're prepared, you know, that you know the route. And you know, sometimes you arrive at the route and you look up and, you know, you've worked it before, but there's something that's uncertain in your head. Like, oh, I, I don't really remember exactly the move or the body position or the foot beta at a spot. And so if you just go, you know, for the red point attempt, thinking that you'll hit it right, um, that go, it could be a wasted effort because you get up there and you don't know the body position, the foot, the foothold. Uh, and so it's kind of a wasted go in that regard. And so that's where maybe, you know, you get to the route and you want to do kind of a bolt to bolt warm up on the project or, you know, climb it with just two hangs at like the beginning or end of, you know, if there's a couple of harder sections uh, and use that kind of warm up go on the route as a refresher. And you can kind of check the feet, check the body positions, the feel beta uh, at the crux. And I use this tactic a lot because, again, as an older climber, Typically, I know I have two good goes. So I kind of do my warm up, and then uh, as the final step of the warm up, climb the route bolt to bolt, or you know, climb it you know, in, in a couple of chunks, uh, and just make sure I know the beta so that when I am giving it a legit go, I can be you know, quick and confident um, and make every go count. So that's the first tip is make every go count. Um, the next one, uh, I mean, and this is pretty obvious, is make sure you're rested enough between goes. Now, again, that really depends on the situation. That long, steep, pumpy route, if you, you know, give it a go and you fall near the top and you have this vicious forearm pump, uh, you know, you're really powered out, that's for most people, a full hour to get recovered, you know, or to get as recovered as you're going to get that day, a full hour. You go much beyond an hour, hour and a half, two hours, then you start to lose your warm up, and that can be too much rest. So it seems for many people that deep pump takes about an hour to subside. Uh, and, you know, if you walk around a little bit, you can accelerate that process a, a bit. Uh, so right around an hour rest, and then you, you give it your good second go, and you know perhaps that's it for the day, at least uh, often is in my case, on that long, steep, pumpy route. Now, what if it is a shorter route that you can give five or six goes, and you're falling off down low, uh, 
at just you know a few bolts or you know not not too far off the ground without a lot of accumulated fatigue well in that scenario you, know, you might be only resting 15 to 30 minutes between attempts um, and again maybe you were able to give it five or six or more attempts you know if it's something short like a boulder problem or a short sport route so it really depends but Make sure, again, you know, you are as recovered as you think you can get before you proceed with your next go. Because, again, the idea of making every um, go count uh, and not wasting any energy or goes. Uh, number three, the perfect warm-up, obviously, is critical. And, again, warm-up is a very... Um, personalized thing uh, you know for me there's so much nuance to my warm-up as an older climber it's a long drawn-out process now, even here training in my home gym I spend pretty much an hour going through uh, a long warm-up which involves a lot of exercises of increasing difficulty and intensity to kind of get the nervous system turned on and you know so if you're a younger climber you know perhaps you can move through the warm-up process more quickly but you know the the elements are still the same you need kind of a generalized warm-up you want to get your heart rate up whether that's through um, you know the hike into the cliff or you know uh, doing some jumping jacks or uh, doing some push-ups uh, you know something to kind of get your heart rate moving uh, doing uh, a warm-up route is a good way to do that, you know, as long as it's quite sub-maximal um, and you're not grabbing anything tweaky uh, in a cold state. Uh, you know, I really like doing a 510, a 511 type warm-up route, uh, then maybe getting on something a little harder and then get on my project. But not, not every crag has that type of route there for you to kind of do that slow progressive warm-up on the route. Uh, and these days, most people, if they're really serious, are carrying some type of a warm-up board. Uh, you know, I have a tension flash board uh, I carry to the crag. You may have something similar to that. Uh, and that, um, though you can do hangs and pull-ups and kind of get a bit of a, a pump going to get the circulatory system, you know, and vasodilation uh, going, um, that warm-up board is most critical for actually turning on the nervous system, you know, your ability to grab small holds or hang on some pockets. And again, you have to use it uh, gradually, you know, big holds first, then medium, and then small over the course of, you know, 10 or 20 minutes doing a variety of hangs. Uh, again, in my home gym, I do that every session to get slowly turned on. The you know, nervous system has to be activated. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course, then some dynamic movements of your shoulders and your hips, you know, flexibility type work, you know, not so much static stretching, but more dynamic stretching, or again, a warm up climb is a good way to kind of become more mobilized. Uh, and that comprehensive warm up puts you in the best position to make every go count uh, when, it, when, when you get on the project uh, and not um, rush onto the project and succumb to that vicious flash pump halfway up where you fall off and it was a terrible effort and it kind of made you so pumped and acidic that it might have ruined your uh, efforts, uh, you know, the rest of the day, perhaps, in, in a worst case scenario. So uh, I err on the side of too thorough and drawn out of a warm-up rather than just rushing the warm-up and getting to the project quickly. Though, you know, my younger days, I did that a lot and was able to seemingly get away with it. And, you know, perhaps you can too, who knows. Um, so, uh, so far we have, um, in terms of little things that make a big difference, uh, the first I gave you was to make every effort count, to be very thoughtful uh, about how you invest your energy on project day. Number two is to get enough rest between goes. So again, you know, every effort counts. Um, and that you are as fully recovered as you can get between goes. Uh, and, and then number three that I just went over is getting the perfect warm up. And again, everybody's perfect warm up is a bit different. You have to learn through trial and error and through years of climbing what works for you. And it, it will change as you get older, no doubt about it. It even changes between day one and day two. If you're out at the crags on day two, you know, one thing I discover is I actually, you know, don't need as thorough of a warm up on day two as I do on day one. You know, day one coming off a, a rest day or two, you're just colder, uh, you know, in terms of 
not only the nervous system, but also the enzymes that are uh, need activated to perform your best. On day two, a lot of that stuff is kind of preconditioned uh, and is still kind of, it's a, a residue from the day before. Uh, and you can get away with a little bit less warm up on day two. Perhaps you've discovered that even though sometimes on day two, you're not 100% fresh and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna give the project a few goes, but you know, I, I probably won't be able to send it because I'm not 100% recovered. And then you do send it, um, and it's because you, your body was more primed. You know, not only maybe do you have some additional knowledge on moves uh, that you, you know from working at the day before, but on day two, sometimes your body is has kind of that residue that of you know warm up, um, and uh, um, you know the bioenergetics are firing for you. So even though your gas tank's not quite full, you're you know, machine is really running cleanly and um, efficiently. Okay, on to number four. Um, know what your best time of day is for a route. Now, you know, sometimes it's the weather that's going di to dictate that, you know, the sun exposure. If it's a cold day, you might need the sun. If it's a warmer day, you might need the shade and knowing uh, where the route's at, you know, the wall aspect, uh, you know, you'll need to kind of plan to have the weather in your favor or the conditions in your favor. Uh, now, if that's not an issue, let's say it's at a north-facing crag that never gets sun, um, yeah, the temperature still changes throughout the day, so that's good to know, and the humidity might be a little lower in the afternoon than it is in the morning. That's good to know if it's a skin-sensitive or, you know, humidity is a, a factor. But also, we biologically have a stronger time of the day. You know, a lot of our, you know, biology uh, operates on a circadian rhythm, uh, and most people are much stronger in terms of grip strength in the afternoon or even early evening than they are in the morning. So uh, it would be a lot better for most people to get on their project at you know, three in the afternoon than at 7 a.m. They would just be naturally stronger. Not that they couldn't warm up very thoroughly and get pretty strong to, 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 to send in the morning if that's what the conditions required, but it's a lot easier to get that warm up and to get peak power, you know, for most people uh, in the afternoon. Uh, there's a variety of research that's been done out there with uh, athletes and other sports, uh, and you know, they find that there's kind of this first little peak in strength about three or four hours after you wake up. Uh, I try to time my morning workout if I'm uh, training at home uh, for, that, for that time. So I get up most days around 6 a.m. So three to four hours after that is 9 to 10 a.m. And so that's when I try to time if I'm going to do a morning hangboard workout or a bit of a climbing session, I try to time it right about then. And then, you know, I have my midday break and eat some uh, lunch and consume some protein and try to get uh, a bit of um, glycogen recovery. And then six or eight hours later, so now this is late afternoon, early evening, that's the second time of day where you tend to have your peak strength and power. And so that's a good, you know, if possible, I try to time my second workout of the day if I'm doing a two a day to be uh, at that time frame. And so you can think about that at the crag, you know, if there's no other factors to consider, uh, you know, when do you tend to feel stronger as a climber? You know, what time of day? And again, everybody's a little different based on your sleep schedules and such. So that was uh, tip number four and uh, on to tip number five, nutritional factors. And this is a big one, you know, what things, what, what foods do you want to avoid consuming in the hours leading up to trying to send your boulder or your project? Uh, you know, for me, there's certain things that I love, like a pastry with my coffee. But on Sunday, if I did that, you know, two hours before going to my project, it would be the worst thing because, you know, I get a bit of a blood sugar spike followed by an insulin spike, and then your blood sugar ends up lower than where it started. Uh, and then you feel kind of weak and sleepy. And uh, I'm kind of sensitive in that way to, to uh, sugars and you know, things that have refined flour and, and, and such. Uh, so I stay away from that stuff on Sunday. And I know like if I'm gonna be climbing in the morning, um, a bowl of oatmeal 
is one of the best things that I can consume because I know that it gives me steady energy. I don't get the spike or this drop uh, and, you know, a, a glass of protein drink or a collagen, you know, those types of things uh, flood my bloodstream with the amino, amino acids that uh, are helpful for an athlete, uh, but not the sugar that could be counterproductive heading into the send. Uh, and if you're only out there for one or two goes, you know, over the course of say two hours, or you're going out for a bouldering session, or if you're even go going to the gym for an hour or two, you don't really need to consume calories, you know, like the way a triathlete is, you know, drinking sugary drinks and gels and, you know, energy bars and bananas and all this stuff. If you're out for an hour or two, you don't really need to supply yourself with, uh, you know, extra calories, glucose, you know, into the bloodstream because you, you know, assuming you've been eating properly in the previous days, your liver is filled with glycogen, your muscles are filled with glycogen, uh, and you have plenty to support muscle function and brain function for, you know, a window of a couple of hours. Now, if you're out at the crag all day, you need to eat, you need to drink, obviously. Uh, if you're at the gym for four hours, well, then you probably want to you know, be snacking on an energy bar or uh, consuming some type of uh, drink that has uh, some calories in it to keep steady glucose through, you know, three, four, five, six hours uh, of activity. You know, and again, it's intermittent activity, so we don't need to consume thousands of calories. Again, the way a triathlete would consume a ton of calories because they're in a steady state activity for many hours, and climbing is a stop and go activity potentially that could last many hours. Uh, so the calorie burn isn't, isn't the same as with you know, one of those endurance athletes. So again, we're all a little different. We have to kind of know what works for us in terms of uh, the foods that make us feel good and able to perform. And you know, for me, I, I tend to err on the side of eating too little early in the day at the crag because uh, you know, too much food in your stomach diverts blood flow there away from your muscles. Uh, and then you start exercising, your muscles aren't uh, working optimally, and the blood then diverts back to your muscles, so then the food doesn't digest optimally, perhaps. Uh, and, you know, so it, it can just, you know, snowball and, and um, make you not feel well on, on Sunday. So avoid big breakfasts, avoid eating a lot of food at the crags, you know, snacking on an energy bar, a piece of fruit, um, a, a, a sports drink that has... Um, you know, a small dilute amount of glucose, not a massive hit of glucose. Uh, I, I don't think gels are really necessary unless you're mountaineering or big wall climbing. You don't need to infuse this massive amount of calories in, in a dense syrup like those gels are. Uh, you know, again, bouldering and sport climbing, really the nutrition has to be specific to, to what we're doing there. And you just can't take what triathlons uh, triathletes or mountaineers do and apply it to bouldering. Uh, it's just not effective. Um, so know what works for you. You know, caffeine. Some people, the caffeine helps sharpen their focus. Um, you know, kind of they feel more energetic and powerful. Other people, the caffeine makes them jittery and shaky. And, you know, you want to stay away from the caffeine. Uh, and, and so you have to know what works for you. Um, what I will say is, if you're out for a long day or a long session at the gym uh, and you get there and you're really pumped and ready to go, uh, you know, you probably don't need caffeine because you're just, you know, you're, you're turned on and motivated and feeling energetic. Uh, but you get two, three, four hours into your session or day at the crags, sometimes a dose, a shot of caffeine, 100 milligrams, maybe at most 200 milligrams, can really um, sharpen your focus and it kind of almost helps hide fatigue. There's quite a bit of research on this, you know, and, uh, you know, so it can help you keep it together mentally and physically longer into the session. Uh, again, I'm thinking, you know, three, four, five, six hours into um, a, a bouldering or cragging session, that dose of caffeine could be quite helpful even though at the beginning of the session, it wasn't necessary. Uh, so find out what nutrition works for you uh, and um, know how to time it just right to make you climb your best and to help you um, keep it together longer through the day in terms of your energy levels, your focus. Um, and that's, you know, requires calories. 
uh, you know, some rest, uh, and you know, maybe some whole, uh, some solid foods. Uh, you know, if you're at the crag all day, you know, having a few energy bars or some type of a healthy sandwich. You know, I eat peanut butter and jelly bagels at the crag. You know, because that's a good source of, you know. Uh, calories and uh, it's delicious and it's kind of a moderate glycemic index so it you know kind of sits well in my stomach and doesn't affect my blood sugar but you have to find out what works for you okay so there are my five tips let me just scroll through the comments here uh, and see uh, if anybody's added any uh, other tips from their own experience and if not maybe there's a few questions here that I'll answer and then we'll wrap things up here soon enough um, Okay, um, from North Wales, Michael, uh, he says he's from Liverpool, I guess living in North Wales, he, uh, he bought a Makita fan uh, and he believes it's a game changer. Yeah, you know, you're seeing a lot of boulders using these fans out there and although I'm not much of a boulder anymore, I get it, you know, you know uh, skin conditions are critical for hard bouldering and uh, a fan can be a difference maker. And I've even seen a few sport climbers like Andra uh, and Daniel Woods, I think I've seen a video of him sport climbing with somebody, you know, uh, aiming a fan, or I guess in Andra's case, there was a climber on a rope with a fan trying to cool him. And so, yeah, that's a good one. You know, the fan could be a game changer, especially if you're a boulderer. Um, Okay, let's see here. Uh, Hamza, uh, any tips for analyzing your own climbing footage? How would you identify reasons for failing to send or to improve? Okay, so that's not a tip, but that's a question, and let me uh, try to give you some help there. Um, you know, the thing about the climbing video is it's, um, especially if it's, you know, a very distant vo video, like from an iPhone tripod stand, you know, looking at you, it's often tough to see the nitty gritty details in terms of your body position or, you know, nuance of, you know, uh, backstepping or little, you know, knee turns in and, you know, things that can make a big difference, you know, in your stability and your uh, movement efficiency are hard to identify. Now, the one thing that's a lot easier to identify on video is your speed of climbing and your tactical, you know, like your approach to the climb. And so that's what I, you know, try to work with climbers on and myself, you know, I videotape a lot of my red point attempts to analyze, you know, like how fast did I get from this rest to that rest, you know, like in terms of seconds, because uh, that speaks to the bioenergetic system being used and, you know, uh, I kind of know what my limiting constraints are with the different energy systems and, you know, so being able to, with practice, climb faster from one rest to the next. If you get five seconds faster, it can make quite a difference. Um, and then how long you can stay at a rest. You know, some rests are good and you can stay at them many minutes and others are, you know, just good for a quick shakeout for 30 seconds, perhaps. Uh, again, it depends on how fit you are and you know how strong you are what type of holds you can rest on uh, but uh, in, in viewing a video you can kind of get a sense of okay you know this go I, I didn't rest very effectively and was it I that I underrested or overrested and you know if you can actually attach a, a you know a, how many seconds that you can identify for climbing sections and for rest sections that can be useful data to collect and then you kind of eventually figure out what uh, is the right uh, timing for you. So that would be the, the big thing to look at there, uh, mainly your tactics. Okay, um, comment here. For me, it's focusing on carbs morning till the send, then saving the protein and fat for after the send. Yeah, and a lot of people feel that way. Uh, I'm kind of the opposite, you know, to be honest. I, I kind of feel more awake and energetic with that dose of protein in the morning uh, and assuming I had a good carbohydrate meal you know the night before that kind of gave me enough uh, glucose and glycogen stores in my body to um, fuel me the next day at least initially um, and so I very often I'm more of a carb backloader type 
approach for me. You know, I eat more carbs the second half of the day or in the evening to replenish the carbohydrate for the next day. Um, uh, but I, I eat protein spaced throughout the day and in the morning it, it actually helps me feel more awake. But, you know, very important to find out what works for you. Some people that have fast metabolisms, and that could be you, uh, need those carbs in the morning because, you know, if you have a fast metabolism, even while you're sleeping, your liver is releasing glycogen or, you know, as glucose into the bloodstream and your brain needs glucose even while you're sleeping. And um, so, you know, you could potentially wake up in the morning with low blood glu glucose uh, and your liver not completely full of glycogen. And so you intuitively feel like you need that dose of carbs in the morning to get you you know, to power you, you know, through the start of the day or into the midday. Uh, and so that could very well be your case. I'm the opposite. I have a very slow metabolism. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't need those calories in the morning as much as I just kind of need the protein, you know, to, to sustain muscle protein synthesis and collagen synthesis, which are slow ongoing processes pretty much 24 seven throughout the day. So I like to have steady doses of protein throughout the day uh, and have, uh, though I, you know, have some carbs, certainly morning and midday, uh, the big, you know, amount of carbs in my diet come late in the day and uh, in the evening. So um, I appreciate that input. And I think there's a lot of people that are in your category in terms of needing that uh, carbohydrate in the morning as well. Um, okay, uh, next uh, question or comment here. Um, what is your op opinion on spreading total training volume of work throughout the whole week instead of three or four long workouts have six days with more or even having have six days with more and even two workouts in a day. Um, I'm not sure I quite get that there. Um, spreading the volume of work throughout the whole week. Um, yeah, okay, I guess, I guess I uh, get what you're saying here. You know, most people do train hard three or four days a week, and then they have three days of relative rest or just kind of recovery exercise or some generalized aerobic and stretching activities. That is more traditional. Uh, and, and, you know, with a lot of veteran climbers, uh, pro climbers, you know, those three or four days might have two workouts a day, which is how I train a lot of the time when I'm in a training block. Like right now, I'm in a training block and I, I do a morning and a, a late day workout. So, you know, and I do that three days a week or four days a week and then I need those other three days as mainly rest days. So I guess you're proposing, what if you do shorter workouts spread out over six days? And um, I wouldn't say it's a terrible thing, but it, it could um, potentially be uh, something that leads you to overtraining. If, you know, if each of those six workouts ends up being hard uh, and let's say fingery, you know, that's an injury waiting to happen. Uh, you know, most climbers just can't do really fingery stuff six days a week and sustain that long-term without getting injured. Because, you know, every time you're doing rigorous activities, especially like crimping and pulling hard, you're breaking down collagen tissue, um, just like you're breaking down on a microscopic muscle. Uh, and so the muscle recovers much more quickly than does the connective tissues. And hence, that's why climbers get a lot more connective tissue injuries than they do muscle injuries. Uh, so you would really need to, if you're uh, gonna climb, you know, be on your fingers six days a week, you'd have to really manage the load. Uh, and I would say, you know, one day being more intense followed by day two being less intense, kind of like less than body weight training on day two and body weight or higher than body weight training day one. And if you um, alternated the load in that way, potentially six days a week could work. You know, I mean, it's good to get that signal to your you know, connective tissues that the, the signal that you get from loading is actually beneficial. It helps turn on the tenocytes that create uh, or extrude collagen that gets, you know, remodeled uh, in your fingers and elbows and shoulders and elsewhere. Uh, you know, so like a runner doesn't on their rest day sit in a chair all day. They still walk around or even go for a jog. Uh, because that can aid the recovery and provide the connective tissues with a signal 
to strengthen. And so I've long been a proponent that even on rest days, a climber can do some light hangboard training at either body weight on big holds uh, or medium holds or less than body weight if you're going to use some smaller holds. Uh, and it's not like a full-fledged workout, but it's instead just some, you know, rest day loading. Uh, in aggregate, just five minutes worth, 10 at most, is all you really need. And there's some good lab evidence that that uh, is uh, a good way to strengthen connective tissues. As long as you don't get carried away and it turns into a real workout that stresses the nervous system and muscles and connective tissues in an intense way. Um, so that would be my concern with a six day a week schedule is that it, you know, it ends up being six pretty hard days that uh, would eventually lead to overtraining or, or injury. Okay, um, on we go, um, this looks like another question here. Does campus board build strength or does it only use strength that you have? I'm stuck at 1357 and can't progress. Should I strength train to improve? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of different types of campus boarding. So, I mean, you know, we tend to think of campus training as being powerful. You know, you see people doing these big, powerful moves that last just a few seconds. So that is classic power or alactic energy system training. Uh, but doing that doesn't make you stronger, really. Uh, it, you know, teaches the nervous system to turn on quickly. It's good for recruitment especially if you're doing like double dyno type campus training or anything that you have to really clutch the, the grips quickly, like on a drop down move, you know, that is really about recruitment, which speaks to power and rate of force development. Um, and so you tend to think about gaining strength with things like weighted pull-ups, uh, and then you can take that strength that you gain that lacks speed, because when you're doing weighted pull-ups, you're moving kind of slowly, but then you go to the campus board without the weight um, and you can do things more quickly. Uh, and that's, uh, and, and for a more advanced climber, you can do those in the same session. It's called a complex. I've promoted that for many years. It's in my training for climbing book. I, I, I use that, my sons use that as kind of a staple exercise where we do weighted hangs, we do weighted pull-ups, and then we take the weight off and we go to the campus board and do some quick movements uh, on the campus board. Uh, and so I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but yeah, you have to kind of know what you're training. Now, one thing you can do if you have a campus board with big holds on it, like wrapper holds, comfortable holds, you could put a weight belt on. And so you say you can do one, three, five, seven on maybe a one inch hold or, you know, a one or two pad hold. Well, what if the, the campus board has a bigger hold? and you put on a 10 pound weight belt and do the one, three, five, seven on that big hold with the 10 pound weight belt, all of a sudden that will be developing some strength, especially if you can go up and, and back down and back up, you know, where you're on there for say 10 or 12 seconds, uh, you know, that makes it more of a strength training exercise. Uh, you're moving more slowly, but you're enduring a bit longer. You know, it's more of a true strength exercise. Like doing a set of five or eight weighted pull-ups would be more of a strength exercise. When you're just on the campus board for three seconds, boom, 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 really quickly, that's power. Um, and it doesn't really build strength uh, in of itself. Um, and so as a climber, we need to do both. And we need to know how to program both. Uh, and um, I, I think I've about covered all that I can there. Okay, um, let's see here. Next up from Natalia. Do you have any suggestions on training when living on the crags? I mean, consistently. I left my country, live in a camping uh, area, and rock climb is a bit unpredictable. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. I hear that a lot from people like, you know, on a road trip, you know, how do you train and keep your strength and power on a road trip if you're out climbing routes uh, or, you know, if you're at a campground or living out of a van for a, a period of weeks, uh, it, it's, it can be tough. Now, if you, you know, some people are starting to, like I know some of my American climber friends like Alex Honnold and Jordan Cannon and, you know, a few others have hangboards in their vans now so they can do not only some warm-up, but also 
a little bit of recruitment type training. Uh, if they're going to take a couple of days off, you know, maybe at the end of their climbing day, they do a little bit of hangboarding that's quite intense, knowing they're going to take two rest days after that. And so they can get uh, a little bit more of an intense finger strength workout than they would get on their route, which tends to be more endurance uh, type climbing, let's say. Um, you know, a portable board, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't have a van, uh, but I, uh, so when I travel in my Jeep, I'll have a flashboard and if we're at a campground, I'll hang it up out of a tree branch. And I, again, I use it for warming up and you could use it for uh, a little bit of finger training to stay in shape. But yeah, that's, that's a challenge, you know, unless you're um, traveling somewhere that you can drive past a climbing gym and, and spend a day uh, training at the gym, uh, it's tough uh, to keep peak shape when you're on a long road trip. I mean, many of the pros who have the financial resources to readily travel, you know, they, they, they train for a month and they go on a trip for a month. And, uh, and then they train for a month and then they go on a trip for a month. Uh, and that way they can always be kind of recapturing their, their peak strength during those training blocks to have them on the climbing blocks, you know, to project their route. Uh, okay. Um, in training cafe number three, you described the Hearst uh, workout weekend, uh, anaerobic lactic, or um, let me see here, anaerobic alactic, anaerobic lactic, aerobic, aerobic. Um, in your energy system podcast, you say max power later in the day is better. Yeah, I mean, again, I, this is a really complex topic talking about energy system training, and it's one of the things I'm really passionate about, and I've done a lot of research on over the last decade, and I've done, a, I think, four very, maybe even five very in-depth podcasts on energy system training a few years ago that you should go back and find those Training for Climbing podcasts to learn some of the science behind the bioenergetics and how those energy systems, you know, they interact. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, inherently, to some degree based on genetics, to some degree based on our training and climbing patterns, uh, have one energy system that's stronger than another. And, you know, then your projects might call on one energy system more than another. So, it's a really powerful topic if you really can wrap your head around it and know how to, um, how to train it uh, and how to get those energy systems to work their best for you at, uh, at the crag or at the boulders. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I don't know exactly how to answer your question here, um, but in terms of max power later in the day, I talked about that earlier in this episode, you know, that... Um, most people are stronger and more powerful in the afternoon than they are early morning. So like the last thing I'd want to do, you know, I get up at 6 a.m. is try to do a max strength or campus board workout at 7 a.m. in the morning, an hour after waking up. Sure, I could do it, but it, it wouldn't be effective. I wouldn't have my peak power. And your goal when you're power training is to be able to elicit full power because that's what it takes to train the nervous system and recruitment you know, at the highest level. So at 7 a.m., I might be able to do some of the activities, but not at full power. Uh, and whereas doing it a little later in the day, now sometimes I do a morning workout, as I mentioned earlier, at 9 or 10 a.m., where I do a, a very thorough warm-up, I do some weighted hangs, I do a little bit of campusing, but that's three or four hours after waking up, not an hour after waking up. And honestly, for most people, they would do even better with that second, that late day peak of strength and power, which might be between 4 and 7 p.m. in the evening. Uh, but that's not to say you can't do it earlier in the day. It's just that, you know, we tend to be inherently stronger and more powerful later in the day based on our natural circadian rhythms, you know, the, just the way our human body has been trained to work. Uh, but um, there are no absolutes. You know, I, I know when uh, Adam Andre was in college uh, a number of years ago, uh, you know, he would go into the gym for a morning workout at, you know, 5 or 6 a.m. and then go to classes in the, you know, eight to lunchtime, uh, and then another gym workout in the afternoon. And 
Um, I don't know what compri you know, his morning workouts are comprised of, but um, you know, if you're young and uh, energetic and enthusiastic, you know, you can train in, in the early morning. I I'm just saying you might not be able to elicit your peak power if you do it too early in the day. Um, so, but there's a lot of other factors, you know, like life factors and what is practical in your schedule that have to be taken into account. I, I work mostly at home now, so I can kind of build my day, uh, my work day around my training, which is just below me here uh, in my basement. And so that's a luxury I have at this stage in my, in my life. I didn't have that for, for many years uh, prior to this, though, of course. Okay, and I want to wrap things up here soon because I've been talking for 45 minutes and, you know, uh, it's um, all good things must come to an end. Uh, you're here for a good time, not a long time, right? And so uh, hopefully we're having a good time here. Uh, um, I guess last question here from Joe. Any advice on how many days off you'd recommend after a shoulder injury? Uh, he says he's 45, has eight years of experience, but a month ago did three straight hard climbing days and didn't have an immediate injury, but woke up with uh, some night shoulder pain. Um, and a month later, I still have pain. Okay, well, first of all, you know, Joe, you're um, not alone there. That is a common storyline I hear from climbers of all ages, but more common perhaps with 40-something or 50-something climbers like you and me. Um, and I'm a little concerned that it still hurts a month later, honestly, um, because, you know, sometimes uh, you have a physical couple of days at the boulders or crags and your shoulders are sore, but it's that muscular soreness, that delayed onset soreness from doing very physical body positions, holding lock-offs a long time, so on and so forth. But you take some time off or you dial back your climbing, dial back your training because you have a sore shoulder and it doesn't go away in a month. That is, you know, connective tissue. So, you know, we have the rotator cuff, uh, you know, muscles and tendons. Uh, the tendons can uh, commonly be injured or, um, you know, uh, tweaked in a way that... Um, you know, uh, causes persistent pain, kind of like medial epicondylitis, you know, or other tendon injuries throughout our body can, um, you know, uh, become, um, you know, provoked um, and then linger for months because connective tissues heal so slowly. So, um, you know, hopefully you're not just taking total rest, uh, avoiding anything that provokes it, like hard bouldering or pull-ups, but you can be doing some rehab in terms of external and internal rotation. And, you know, I don't want to get into the exercises, but there's a half a dozen shoulder type rehab exercises that you could do to load and strengthen the muscles and give those tendons signal. Um, consuming daily supercharged collagen, uh, you know, which is the Fizzy Vantage product, of course, uh, can provide the collagen specific amino acids to aid that. Uh, healing and remodeling, uh, but it's still not guaranteed to go away. And here's why. It's possible that you have a tear in your labrum in your shoulder. Uh, and that's something that many, many climbers have. Uh, I, I mean, I hear from climbers on a weekly basis that uh, end up discovering they have a torn labrum. Some of them have had it for years and didn't know it, and it just became kind of more aggravated. Uh, other people you know, fall on their arm or, you know, do a campus move and their shoulder dislocates and, you know, they get a labrum tear of some kind. Um, and there's different severities and types of tears. Uh, but the labrum doesn't heal itself. There's nothing you can do to rehab and heal, uh, uh, you know, a labrum tear. You can strengthen the shoulder and help it stay in place. But when that labrum's torn, your shoulder becomes more mobile you lose kind of that suction that it provides that holds the humeral head in place. And hence, you return to hard bouldering or hard climbing or, or pull-ups, and you hear clicking or you, you feel movement or you have a pain that's provoked um, in certain arm positions. 
Um, and that's the classic sign of a torn labrum. So I don't want to get ahead of you. Hopefully that's not your case. But if this continues, say for another month, you do the rehab, um, you get enough protein in your diet, you're doing all the things right to help you know, it recover, and it doesn't, uh, I would say a month from now is when you call the doctor and say, oh, hey, we, I'd like to you know, see a sports medicine doctor. Um, you know, they can do an arthrogram where they inject some dye in and then they do uh, like an MRI type imagery that will show fairly conclusively what is going on. You can get to the bottom of it real fast in terms of they can see the tendons, you know, quality, uh, whether there's an issue there and they can see the labrum if there's a tear there. Um, and then you know exactly what you're dealing with. Uh, again, hopefully that's not the case, but if you know, shoulder pain that persists, clicking that persists, um, getting twinges of pain in different arm positions as you're bouldering or climbing. Those are all things that uh, you know, really speak to climbers having a torn labrum. And again, I think if you MRI'd the shoulders of veteran climbers, you would see that about half of them, even if they don't know it, have a labrum tear that is um, affecting them. And you know, a lot of people fall out of climbing later in life because their body falls out of climbing. Um, and so to stay you know, in it, the game the long time, like I am trying to do at age 58, you need to stay on top of the body more than ever and uh, gather the, the data and make quick decisions on what you need to do. Like I, I get blood work done every three months because I want to know and track various blood parameters uh, that relate to older guy fitness and performance. Um, for a younger athlete, it's, it's really probably TMI if you're in your 20s to, to get the regular blood data. Um, uh, but as you get older, you know, kind of, if you're passionate as I am, leave no stone unturned. And when it comes to injury, you kind of want to know sooner than later what is going on. And so there's a long answer to what was a simple question. Hopefully, you just have a little tweak that a month from now it's gone forever. But if you don't, if it persists, then... I would go get uh, see a doctor and get some imagery, and uh, you know. And by the way, the final comment is uh, they these surgeons are so good now they can patch you up, and have you back climbing harder than ever um, in six to twelve months. In, in many cases, after a shoulder you know cleanup type procedure. So with that um, note, I will I guess sign off here. Uh, thank you for joining the cafe this time around. I hope to see you again. Try, trying to get back on a schedule here now that my summer travels are behind me uh, and uh, do one of these every couple of weeks on Monday at noon. P please help spread the word. Tell people about Training Cafe. Uh, they can watch this after the fact. They can tune in live and ask questions uh, to future episodes. Of course, the Training for Climbing podcast is a monthly thing that you can check out if you haven't already. Uh, I'm going to be recording a new one uh, later this week that'll be out next week. So I hope you'll check that one out. Um, and uh, check out fizzyvantage.com. That's my uh, climbing nutrition business. Uh, you can use uh, coupon code FRIENDS15, save 15% off any full-priced Fizzy Vantage. And with that, I'll let you go. Until next time, be safe, be strong, climb on.